Um, so we've discussed <laughs> life cycle assessment. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper into the circular economy. And I'd like to invite Bahar Koyunshu. She is Senior Policy Officer at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to tell us something about food packaging in the circular economy. I will try. Please, <laughs> welcome Bahar. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today with you. First of all, I would like to thank to the Food Packaging Forum team and Jane for the kind invitation and for all the scientific knowledge she has provided throughout our exchanges at EMF. And also to Garans, who actually leads this work at EMF, um, the health implications of plastics. But she couldn't make it here today, so I will try to do my best to, to replace her. Um, so... Um, I would like to first say a few words about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We collaborate uh, with uh, many stakeholders, uh, businesses, uh, academia, governments, NGOs, in order to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And the circular economy that we envision is built on key three principles. It's about elimination of waste and pollution by design, circulating and products and materials uh, at their highest value uh, in the economy, and restoring and regenerating nature. Uh, the numbers speak for themselves, so these are the consequences of the linear economy we are currently operating in. Uh, maybe I can deep dive a bit to the first bucket that we have there. It's 8 million tons of plastic that are entering the ocean every year. So based on the current estimations, there is more than 150 million tons of plastic already in the ocean. If we continue with this rate, by 2050, we estimate that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by weight. And this is just an enormous impact that we are having on the planet. And from this 150 million tons of plastic, we estimate that about 20% are additives. Uh, so Jane was also uh, mentioning those. And they're also leaching into the organisms that are in, in, in the oceans and eventually to our bodies as well. Um, but there are solutions. So, uh, we know that if we would switch a part of our plastic packaging to reusable solutions, for example, we could cut um, this leakage into the oceans at least by 20% by 2040. So as EMF, um, we have been very active on the topic of plastics. It all started with the uh, new plastics economy in 2016, where we brought together uh, the best knowledge and the different stakeholders to see how a plastics economy that is respecting the planet and the people on the planet uh, could look like in the future. Uh, as we have seen the opportunity on reuse, then we had a deep dive in reuse. We had a publication on reuse where we showed the best examples from around the world and the different models of reuse. And then more recently, uh, we had a global commitment where we brought together um, many businesses and also governments around the common vision for plastics. And here we are also doing a yearly uh, reporting to see the progress versus those 2025 goals. And I'm going to talk to you about that in, in a second. So to shortly recap, because I know we have little time, um, the new plastics economy vision uh, is comprising of a very holistic vision for plastics. It uh, covers the elimination of problematic and unnecessary plastic packaging. Uh, the plastic packaging, of course, should be free of any hazardous chemicals. Reuse models have to be an integral part of it. Um, there should be recyclable packaging, which is uh, recyclable by design, but also recycled at uh, scale and re reality. And of course, the plastic um, should be fully decoupled from the consumption uh, use of finite resources, basically. So coming to the global commitment, um, here we have brought together um, more than 1,000 organizations uh, that actually represent more than 20% of the plastic production globally. And uh, we have commitments and targets in place uh, for 2025 uh, to, for elimination uh, for moving to reuse models and to improve recyclability of packaging as well as reducing the virgin plastics. So um, here are the key messages from our last report. Uh, it's a mixed picture, so it's not all pink. Um, while we see that there is strong progress made in some areas, such as increasing recycled content, we see that uh, the companies are unfortunately lagging behind on certain areas, such as uh, reuse. It's still below 2% and it is remaining in the pilot land, basically. We don't see the scale that's much needed. 
And uh, with this, um, we believe that the, the businesses need to accelerate their action, as well as governments, which need to provide the enabling conditions to these companies in order to be able to scale up solutions to move to a circular economy for, for plastics and for packaging. And with the global commitment, what we are really trying to do is to have transparency in the system. If you look into the reports, you can see the different statistics from the different companies that are uh, voluntarily uh, a part of the, the global commitment. And this, we hope, will help inform legislation. And there's a lot of activity in the legislative space, which I will also cover at the end of my presentation. So, with this being said, as we saw that there is huge potential for reuse, but here the, the big question is, how do we make it scalable? And this is where we really need to make a transformation change. Uh, we actually have been working on a project to see how we can upscale uh, returnable packaging systems. This is a preliminary uh, results that I'm going to share now. And the full publication will come out in November, but we thought it could be of relevance for, for this uh, forum to already share some initial insights. Um, so we looked into uh, the effects of different factors. Um, so scale, meaning um, the portion of single packaging that is converting into reusable packaging. The return rates, so consumers bringing back um, their containers for them to be reused again. Um, sharedness of infrastructure, we see that collaboration has a very big impact, so we modeled different scenarios where there's not much collaboration happening, which is a kind of scenario today, to where there's a lot of collaboration happening and sharing of infrastructure, and standardization of packaging. Um, here I think the graph is a bit, may look a bit complicated, um, but what I can say in a nutshell is that um, we have looked into food packaging, uh, so the wet and dry application, so you can think of your pasta, for example, for the dry application. For uh, wet application, you can think of your yogurt cup, for example. Uh, we looked into beverage packaging, and then we also looked into personal care. Uh, we have covered a range of uh, packages, different, stand, different formats, different sizes, um, and uh, of course, these all have different frequencies of, of consumers buying a, a new one, right? So here, what you can see is that across all the different sectors we have modeled, there are a very important environmental benefits. This is a point of discussion uh, under the packaging and packaging waste regulation, for example. So we wanted to really see whether there are environmental benefits when um, the right level of scaling is taking place in the space of a reuse system. So you can see here that uh, there's up to 69% of greenhouse gas emissions reductions when the single-use system is going into a reuse system. Uh, up to 70% uh, water use reduction and more than 70% of material uh, use reduction. And oftentimes, the economics is also a big question, and we see that actually the returnable packaging can compete uh, with single-use packaging, and it does also create a significant number of jobs. Um, now, what I want to also mention is that, um, as you know, we have a limited carbon budget left to be able to still meet 1.5 degree targets, and plastics overall has a big impact. So reuse actually does possess a big opportunity for us to stay within the carbon budget that's left for the specific industry. And now I would like to come to the policy developments. There's a lot going on in this space. Um, of course, there's a lot of, um, let's say, development and uh, research in the space, as uh, Jane was also mentioning earlier. We see that uh, big organizations such as uh, UNEP and WHO is doing quite some work in the area. Um, and there's also the civil society movement, so uh, more and more awareness is, is becoming and uh, getting realized by the civil society initiatives. And we also see some voluntary movements from the different companies, which are very much needed in this space. Um, on the policy momentum, I think we could, it could take a day maybe to just uh, look into the UN plastic treaty, the nation level developments, because there are some countries that are banning certain hazardous chemicals and also at the EU level. But I'm going to have a closer look at the EU uh, as there's quite some 
movement <laughs> in that space. Um, so here I try to summarize um, the different big building blocks of the legislation that is related to a circular economy for food packaging. Uh, I'm sure you are aware that there was a recommendation on safe and sustainable materials by the Commission the previous year. It puts safety at the core of the sustainability assessments. It's a very interesting piece of work as it is a guiding uh, framework for innovation and for businesses to make the right choices as they design new chemicals and materials. And then, um, of course, on the regulation side, we also see that um, there's the Eco-Design for Sustainable Product Regulation, uh, which is now being shaped, and it foresees a digital product passport uh, where there would be transparency around the chemicals and substance of concern. Um, food packaging is di not directly in scope, but this is very relevant on the chemical side. Then there's the REACH, um, for which there are additional revisions that are going to come uh, in the short term as part of the chemical strategy for sustainability. And then the two big uh, blocks are the packaging and packaging waste regulation, for which now there are targets uh, for food and beverage sectors for refill and reuse. And there's a lot of debate going on. Uh, so we, we shall see how the final piece of legislation will look like, because the Commission proposal is out there, but then the Parliament and the Council is going to form their opinions, and at the end there will be one common text coming out of this. And then on the food contact materials, which is going to be revised, unfortunately it has been delayed, but it's going to be revised, it is really putting safety, but not only safety, also sustainability into the core of the revision. Um, so looking into the funding opportunities, uh, I think Martin was mentioning that before. I guess you may be aware, but I thought it could be of interest to capture what is out there. So from the Horizon 2020 program, almost all of the clusters have a relation to a, a circular economy for food packaging. Um, I would like to mention one specific one, which is cluster four. It's about development of safe alternatives. I don't know, is it okay? Yeah. And, um, and there's a good chunk of budget out there. So if you think that any of your research projects may fit into this, I would uh, invite you to have a look into this um, uh, cluster and this uh, innovation action. And then also the European Investment Bank has, a, uh, has some funding available for circular economy projects and also specifically around reuse as well. So um, going forward, it's really important that we take a, a f accelerated action and a comprehensive look into the circular economy for food packaging. We see that there is more and more scientific evidence coming through uh, publications and research that there's chemicals migration happening in pe packaging. There is generation of uh, micro and nanoparticles during use. And the policy and upcoming legislations do provide uh, a good comprehensive basis to, to form the right conditions for the industry to move into the right direction. Because we need the scale, we need the legislative direction so that the industry can make the right investments in the right place. And uh, a circular economy for food packaging is possible if we eliminate hazardous chemicals and unnecessary plastics, if we innovate uh, for alternative um, delivery systems and also for safe materials, and if we circulate these safe materials in a safe manner, basically. So thank you for your time now. I hope I managed to stick to my 10 minutes or whatever. <laughs> yes, good, thank you. Thank you so much, Baha, thank you yes. uh, for, for sticking, thank you. sticking to time. We're, we're now back on track.